but for the best surfing, you'll want to actively steer the boat onto the glassy part of the wave. When people are first trying to catch their waves, they, they aren't necessarily thinking about steering the boat yet. They're thinking about, what's this wave gonna do to me that's coming from behind me? And they're thinking about getting that forward momentum, getting the boat moving. The tail gets picked up first, and is moving and lifting, and the bow is still essentially sitting on still water, if you will, so the tail's getting moved first. Lean forward, good, lean forward. Now rudder. When you're learning to surf, the rudder stroke is a big key to catching and staying on waves. Awesome. If you don't rotate your torso, then you won't get the blade angled correctly. It's important to learn a quality rudder stroke. This is with the blade angle straight up and down in the water and the paddle shaft parallel to the boat so it's streamlined and doesn't slow you down. To get the paddle in this position, you have to turn your torso and put this hand high. That allows you to get the blade deep into the wave so you'll get a lot of control. Any variation from this means that you're just bracing and slowing down the boat and you won't get the control you want. A lot of folks think all that power comes from your arms, but it really doesn't. To really harness the power of this quality rudder, you want to use your lower body, moving your boat sort of like the boat was your tail. More advanced paddlers often need braking rudders to slow down and turn on larger, steeper waves. Rudders help you avoid purling or dropping the bow straight in. In the shallows, this is dangerous, and in bigger waves, it's a violent end to a ride. Leaning back and steering precisely will help you avoid the purling problem. I love surfing out here on the open coast. Wide open, not too many other surfers to run into. Nothing but you and the waves and the whales. Whales are going off outside. Now it's my turn. All right. Whew. Cut. Roundhouse. Cut back to the foam. It's bigger. <laughs> Kayak surfing's a lot of fun, no matter what sort of boat you're paddling. But if you're just getting started, remember to pick smaller waves so you can peg the fun meter. Understanding and picking the right waves will help you enjoy kayak surfing. Waves start from ocean swells that are caused by storms far out from land. Generally, isolated storms create the best surfing waves, building into parallel wave fronts. As a swell gets into shallower water, it stands up into a more distinct wave shape. A wave begins to break when the depth of the water is roughly 1.3 times the wave height. So the surf zone is a result of the incoming swell interacting with the bottom contour. A sudden change of depth tends to create a pitching wave, while a gradual bottom contour tends to create a mushy wave. Waves generally arrive in groups called sets. The number of waves in a set will vary, but if you watch the surf for a while, you'll see a definite pattern develop. When surfing, it's very important to understand this pattern and get a sense of the rhythm of the ocean. Wind waves are typically more localized, choppier, and less predictable. So wind-free mornings are often the best time for surfing at the ocean. So one of the first things you want to do when you decide to go surfing is figure out what sort of wave you want. So let's take a look. The types of things that I think that uh, beginning paddlers should know about the ocean are primarily having to do with the ocean currents and the way the waves break. Uh, whenever you come to a new spot, you want to see where your dangers are. Are the waves taking, you know, would they take a buoyant object like a kayak all the way into, say, a bunch of rocks or cliffs or something like that? Rocks are a clearly visible hazard, but currents can be deceptive. Once waves dissipate along a steep beach or rocky shoreline, 
there's a lot of water looking for somewhere to go. This creates currents along the beach that can be pretty substantial. In your boat, this is typically not a big problem, as long as you keep your bearings so you don't get swept into rocks or areas crowded with swimmers. For a swimmer, rip currents can be threatening. In a rip current, two currents meet and combine to funnel water out to sea. They create an area with smaller waves or no waves breaking. If you're caught in a rip current, paddle or swim along the beach, not directly against the current. It's also good to realize that the current dissipates outside the breaking surf. Rocks and currents are hazards to be alert for, but the type of surf break is most important for quality learning. So don't look back, just paddle and aim to the right a little bit and then cut left. The most common type of surf is a beach break. At first glance, it may look uniform down the beach, but changes in swell direction, tide height, and bottom configurations can give a variety of surf conditions, from peeling waves with big, well-formed shoulders to pitching waves that close out and leave a kayaker few options. If you're working a shore break right on the beach where everything tends to close out all at once, which unfortunately is where a lot of people think that's where they need to start with, with kayak surfing, and realistically it's probably the toughest and worst place to start because it's very difficult to get out through it initially without already having those skills. The rides tend to be very short and, and somewhat uh, dramatic, if you will. The potential for injury is actually a lot greater when you're working in shore break. So and a lot of times you can pick a place where there's a little bit less energy dumping right on you as you're trying to go out through it. If you watch for a while, you can kind of determine where that is and you try and get them where they have kind of high bits and low bits to the wave. But every now and then, one will come in which is just the entire width of the, of the beach. It's a bit of a lottery and there's no escape and you're just looking at this wall of water that's like twice the height of your house because the beach is so equal to where the wave's coming in and the whole thing trips up in one go and uh, that can be fun. But you're landing on sand, it's not quite as bad as uh, rock. The regularity of shore breaks often sends kayakers in search of the ideal surf location. One of the best places to surf is off of point break. It gives you an opportunity to get out to the lineup without having to pound your way through incoming surf. When parallel lines of swells reach a point of land, they refract around the point, bending into progressively shallower water. Depending on the swell direction and bottom contour, this can create a series of ideal surfing waves. Many point breaks have waves that reform several times. Each successive reform is smaller, gentler, and more friendly. Point breaks allow for multiple times to attack the whitewater, which is rarely possible on a beach break. Plus, it's easier to get out and find the ideal takeoff spot. A map of the coastline, combined with knowledge of the size and direction of a swell, can give you ideas for where to look to find a wrapping point break situation. Just like a point break, a reef break can be a lot of fun to, to surf as well because the reef is simply a shallow spot out in the ocean. The waves break over that reef, giving you deep water exits on both sides. So you can paddle out through the deep water, get into the lineup, surf it and get off and never have to deal with a, with a beach break. Uh, reef breaks are usually um, much tighter much shallower at the bottom of the wave, uh, usually a lot riskier. So if you make a mistake, it's uh, you usually end up breaking something. At the ocean, you can never really control the conditions, but anticipating what they might be is an important skill developed with years of experience. There are essentially three factors that I look for when I uh, look for surf. One is the swell height and direction, one's the wind, and the other one's the tide. Basically, you want a long period swell from a, a storm some distance away. You'd like uh, the size that uh, you feel comfortable in, or maybe just a little bit bigger. And you'd like uh, either no wind to form classy conditions, or you'd like an offshore wind that will hold up the waves to allow you to make those critical sections. And the third thing is the tide. So each location is different, and each location wants, if you will, a, a different tidal level. So I'll scout out the, my favorite locations and see 
whether they break best at low tide, high tide, or an incoming tide, or an outgoing tide, and make my decision based upon the tidal level. Surfers refer to the size of the wave by two systems, the height of the wave face, and occasionally by the swell size. For surfers, this means that the swell size is approximately half the size of the wave face. Board surfers sometimes describe waves by the wave face measured against their body, for instance, waist high, head high, or double overhead. Be sure you understand which sizing system is in local use before you head out for a surf session. A swell size of five feet with a 20 second interval along with a 10 knot offshore wind would be ideal for experienced ocean paddlers. People who are learning would have more fun with a three foot wave every 15 seconds. Swells with longer periods produce more powerful waves than short period swells. But short period swells, say three to five seconds, like those near the center of a storm, are unruly and very difficult before, during, and between rides. When you arrive at the surf, take a few minutes and get tuned into the rhythm of the waves, their size, and their frequency. A few minutes of study will pay off well. Especially if you can get up high, you can get a big picture feel that is difficult once you're on the water. First thing you want to do is, is really stand there and watch the surf for a while. Be very conscious of what sort of the maximum size swells are that are coming through, how those waves are reacting, what they're doing as they approach the shore. Are they, for instance, pitching out in front of themselves quite a ways? And are they breaking in any way from like left to right or right to left? Let's look at some of the anatomy of a wave. Here you can see the peak, the white water, and the shoulder. The pocket is the steep part of the wave, where the wave is actively breaking. It's the transition zone between the glassy wave and the breaking part. It's right where the green, green water and all the white water, how the white water is engulfing kind of the green section of the wave and it's where the, the, the power is generated, all your speeds just going, just blasting through that area. And it's, it's probably the best part about surf kayak. I mean, just you're able to find that and just go flying 100 miles an hour and it's just like, ah, it's really fun. It takes a lot of experience to evaluate swell size, wind direction, and the tide, and conclude what sort of waves you'll have available to play. To learn about local conditions, check with local paddlers or call a wave forecasting service or check on the internet. Once you understand waves, the type of breaks, the hazards and conditions, it's time to play. Let's study how to get out through the surf zone then we'll find the takeoff zone for some good rides. When you're launching your kayak through the surf, that's really a, a, the toughest part of the whole thing because you're taking off through the waves, your body's not warmed up, you're not, you're not used to the boat yet and comfortable in it, but you still have to be able to put a lot of power and have a lot of skill right in that surf zone. It's a commitment. You can't be tentative about getting out through a surf zone. So what you have to be thinking about is, okay, once I'm in the water, I'm heading out there, you want to be looking at the waves the whole time. Whenever you're in the surf, you're always keeping your eyes peeled out towards where the waves are coming from. All right, good, now paddle into it. Just paddle straight into it. That's it. Real nice, and one of the things you did there, you actually had your boat a little bit to the side, and you took a good stroke that lifted your nose up and over the wave, and I do that all the time. You also have to be able to tell, make the decision if a wave is probably going to break still out in front of you to back off and actually backstroke in some cases, hold up, let that wave break, expend that energy, then drive towards it and punch out through it. To do that, you want to have a very vertical forward stroke, accelerating the boat best as possible along with a good torso rotation so that you're getting your full upper body strength and not just using your arms. Because you can close that gap very quickly and typically you're going to make it. If you commit to that, it's, 
it's a wave that you feel is going to break somewhere near you when you first see it, go for it because you're likely to get through it and be on the outside. The more you hesitate or the more you change your mind, the more likely you are to get caught inside for quite a while and, and get rolled over a few times. As I'm paddling out through the surf and I hit that first really big wave, I'm going to want to dip my head to headbutt the wave. Take the paddle, spear it into the face, doing an aggressive power stroke right through the wave. I don't want to go through the wave with the hands over the head or in front of the teeth. Both can cause serious injury. The headbutt leaves you less exposed to the power of the wave and helps you avoid leaning back. A forward tilted posture is the most stable position. The next step is the takeoff. An ideal takeoff uses a combination of positioning and timing to find the powerful pocket of the wave. The more vertical the wave, the more critical your positioning. One of the questions I get asked most frequently is where do you take off in the wave? And the answer to that varies depending upon whether you have a point break, a reef break, or a beach break. But in general, you're looking for the peak of the wave and you want to take the peak of the wave because that's the highest point on the wave and the steepest location, so that's going to be the easiest takeoff point. So you take off on the peak, you drive down, accelerate, hit the bottom, into your bottom turn, and you'll go away from that peak, either right or left, depending upon the shape of the wave. So I'm always looking for the peak, for the prime takeoff spot on the wave. The problem is that spot changes from time to time. The peak shifts around depending upon the swell direction and the type of the bottom, and the, whether you have a point break, a reef break, or a beach break. But I paddle out, find the peak that I want to be at, and I set up myself with reference points on the shore so I can come back to that spot really quickly and then make small adjustments as the peak shifts around from there. One of the, the initial critical factors is setting up where that wave is going to be very steep at the point of takeoff so that there's a lot of acceleration on your boat due to gravity but not quite in that critical place where it's going to break right on top of your head as that occurs. So keep your reference points as far as like the jetty, the pier, looking towards shore. Things that to help you return to your favorite takeoff spot, look for markers on the shore, chimneys, cliffs, trees, and use these to establish reference lines. Try to find something that gives you an exact line marker, like lining up two poles then look for clues in the water. You have to identify where the waves have been breaking. And that's typically fairly easy to do just by a white foam line from the previous wave, um, assuming that there have been some waves breaking there. And you can set up right alongside that foam line is, is sort of the classic example of where to be. And gradually you'll sort of work your way into that, that focal point where it's going to be optimal for catching the waves. So once you're actually sitting in that, that great spot that you've determined to be sort of the ultimate takeoff place, the next trick is actually getting on the waves. And again, it's a commitment. It's, it's aggressive paddling typically to get your boat moving, getting it up to hull speed a little bit before that wave gets to you. And then as you feel that wave picking up the tail of your boat, you're going to be thinking about leaning forward with your body weight. And instead of taking deep strokes, you're thinking about quickening up the pace of your strokes, much faster, much more shallow strokes, if you will, almost like a little windmill is a term that I use, to get yourself going down the face of that wave. And you don't want to quit, even if it feels like it's going out from under you, just commit to that concept that you're going to get on that wave. When you sprint to catch a wave, use a quick arm stroke and keep your craft running perpendicular to the wave. The best paddlers can catch waves with a minimum of strokes. They're able to do this by selecting waves carefully and positioning themselves in front of the peak of the wave, near where it's going to break. Try timing your paddling so you reach top speed exactly when the top of the wave would hit your seat. Then remember to steer. If you're far from the break, drop onto the wave and angle towards the break so you can tap more power of the pocket. If you drop in close to the peak, your first turn will take you down the line of the breaking wave. This first turn is called a bottom turn. If you're in a short, high-performance surf kayak, you'll need to set up very close to this critical spot. Otherwise, you'll need to use continuous paddling to get established. 
Sometimes an aggressive forward lean can start the boat down the wave face. To catch a wave, you'll have to be committed and paddle aggressively. At the same time, your strokes need to be efficient. As you're stroking down the face of that wave, you want to keep the boat nice and quiet without any wobble, because even a little bit of wobble will cause your boat to scrub speed and lessen your chances of catching that ride. Once you've got the wave, it's time to develop an understanding for control technique so you can get the most from your rides. If you're surfing a flat bottom planing hulled boat, you'll turn off your inside edge and use your paddle as a pivot point. Most other boats have softer chines or more rocker end to end. So for these boats, you'll sometimes turn on the inside edge and other times turn on the outside edge. For most of these boats too, the rudder becomes real important. A planing hull boat has a unique stroke feel. It takes a while for the paddle to kind of sink in. And when it does, uh, it's kind of like uh, being on the end of a rope and having someone swing you around. You really feel the, uh, the whiplash effect. And when I turn, I really lean way forward on, on the boat. Uh, I don't want to sink the tail too much. I don't want to drag off the tail. I want to use uh, much more of the front part of the boat to help uh, start the carve. Well-developed skill and timing at getting off of a wave allows you to enjoy more sweet, glassy rides rather than getting side surfed all the way into shore and having a long paddle out. The best system for getting off a wave is to turn and get off just before the wave closes out. Another system is to lay a high brace on the pile and flip into the pile, allowing the wave to pass underneath you. Then come up on a sculling brace. Another system is to rock the boat back and forth to build momentum to climb out. If that doesn't work, you can use an endo to catch quiet water under the wave. Try to knock it off the foam. We go, lining it up. Get a little more speed. Smack it around. Look, I'm out of the wave with an ender. Pirouette. Avoid smacking the rocks. Once you're ready to return to shore, you'll appreciate the time you have taken to evaluate the conditions. It's very difficult to look back in and tell what's going on because you're only looking at the back of a, of a wave or a horizon line. And it's difficult to judge size and shape and landing site and everything when you're out beyond the waves. When you're coming in through the surf zone, you're actually trying to land on the beach. One of the techniques that you can use is to set up on the back side of a wave and essentially follow it in, paddling on kind of the top or the back side of that wave. Instead of being out in front of all that breaking energy, you play off of it and you use that depth of the water that's created by that wave to get higher up onto the beach for your landing. It's a fact of life. Anywhere there's an accessible surf zone, there are going to be other people out there enjoying it. As kayakers, we have a responsibility to learn some of the rules so everyone will have lots of fun. If you go out in the surf and you just think you're going to learn and just ignore the rules, uh, you're, you're wrong. Someone's going to let you know you're out of place and that's not going to be a lot of fun. So you want to make sure you go out there, you respect the traditions and the rules that go along with playing in the surf. One of the first ones is just, again, where you choose to surf, picking a place where you're, you have absolutely no possibility of you or your boat running into people that are playing in that surf area. Whether it's little kids, adults, whatever, there's a lot of other users out there, and you have to make sure that you're staying clear of them. When you're going out into a particular break to go surfing, you want to be really confident in your own skills and abilities. 
as far as being able to surf that particular spot and that particular break. Especially if there's other users out there, board surfers, other paddlers, etc. You do not want to be a hazard to them. And if you don't feel totally confident about your ability to be in control, you should go surf somewhere else. Kayakers have to realize that when they arrive at the surf, they're entering a frequently crowded area with long established rules and traditions. To tell us more about some of these rules, we caught up with world-renowned big wave surfer Richard Schmidt. He starts by explaining some of the ways kayakers can inadvertently find themselves in trouble with the rules. When you get out in a situation where there's a lot of people in the water, you just want to really look around and try to be respectful and as courteous as you could be. I think a lot of people are intimidated by kayaks because you have such an advantage. You have a paddle, it's a big boat, you could catch swells well before they break and you could paddle out from the inside just like that. So I think you have to kind of realize the advantage you have and, and try not to take too much advantage of it. You know, with kayaks, you could definitely catch a swell well before any surfer could ever uh, even paddle for the wave. You can catch the wave while it's still a swell. So I guess you have to just kind of be aware of that and you know, try to be courteous as much as you can. On, on a kayak, if a big wave hits you, you get knocked sideways for a while and it's really hard to break out of that sideways thing when you're in the white water. And um, as a surfer, I've seen this happen a lot where I'm paddling out and there's nothing the kayaker could do and the only thing I could do to save myself is dive under. And a lot of surfers see that and they're very intimidated by kayakers out in the same surf alongside them. As founder of his own highly acclaimed surf schools, Richard Schmidt has experience introducing people to the surf zone. I tell my beginning surfing students that they should learn on a soft surfboard so they don't present a hazard to themselves or anybody out there. Uh, kayakers don't have a, that luxury. They don't have those soft, spongy kayaks like surfers. So you want to make sure you get yourself in a situation that's not real crowded and really learn basic skills um, away from everybody else. Uh, you don't want her to see a crowd of surfers or kayakers go, okay, well that must be where the best waves are and paddle into the middle of them. Be uh, creative. Look, or, look at the ocean and try to find a niche where maybe you can get away from the crowd and really learn your skills to get really confident before you get yourself around any other surfers or, or kayakers. Surfer or kayakers paddling out through the surf, you want to make sure and paddle well around the surf. You don't want to see a group of surfers or kayakers and paddle out straight towards them because they're going to catch a wave and you're going to be an obstacle for them. You have to clear way around it. You know, it's a real bummer as a surfer when you get a really good wave and you have to run an obstacle course on this wave because of people paddling out. So you make sure and paddle way off to the side. Well-developed vision patterns are important for heading out and avoiding others on a wave. Once you catch the wave, be alert for others paddling out and anyone else on the wave. Surfers agree that the right of way goes to the surfer who catches the wave first. And if it's close, it goes to the surfer closest to the break. A lot of times, if it's close as to who has caught the wave first, it's generally the person that's the closest to the curl, the surfer that has the inside. That's the mo most defining rule of right-of-way with surfers. We go out, and if it's crowded, it's a lot more courteous if you sit off to the side and you kind of wait your turn, you know, you watch a couple people get a wave, you kind of see how the waves are and, and you work your way in rather than just paddle right past everybody and sit behind everybody and think, okay, well, I'm up, it's my turn, you know. You kind of have to take turns to an extent. Some surfers feel that since they've been there longer that they kind of have, uh, they kind of have more right to the waves than anybody else. Now, I'm not saying that's right, but there is kind of an underwritten rule that people that have been surfing a long people that have been surfing in an area for a long time, you kind of have to respect. It's like when I travel to Hawaii and I paddle out to a new spot, I'm not going to be overly aggressive. I realize there's people that live there that have been surfing there a really long time. I want to kind of tread lightly and just kind of get a few waves and, and not really uh, wear out my welcome. So it's something to think about. I think what's really important is respecting the other people out in the water. Have a smile. You know, say good day, whatever. Don't go out there and be real aggressive and think I'm going to get a lot of waves and I don't care about anybody else. You know, if 
you catch less waves and you're a little bit nicer with your approach you're going to get respect in return you can have a lot more fun oh yeah oh yeah that's you buddy kayakers can expand the sport by finding surf that requires a little bit of a paddle to get to You learn how to sit down? <laughs> I want to sit. <laughs> Back to the ocean. <laughs> Once you know the basics of kayak surfing, know how to pick the best waves, you'll want to learn some more advanced techniques so you can go out there and really shred it up. To help your skills grow quickly, work to develop strategies to get the most out of each wave. To optimize a ride, you'll need to be aware of constantly changing wave shapes and be able to use a variety of skills and moves. You'll be looking to get long rides, and use radical maneuvers in the critical sections of the largest and best formed waves you can find. Okay, I'm going to show a few basic uh, surf kayak moves. Uh, there's a couple different ways to drop into the wave. If you're way out on the shoulder, you want to kind of fade into the peaks. So you want to angle in, paddle in towards it, and just when you get close to the foam, you want to turn and go straight down to make your bottom turn. Now, if you're closer to the peak, or the steepest part, you want to drop straight down, lean back to not pearl the boat, Lean back, keep that nose up. Again, come straight down to set the wave up. If it looks like uh, it's a slow moving, uh, developing wave, then you want to draw that turn out, maybe even come back a little bit before you turn. Now, if it's a fast developing wave, you want to start that angle, set that edge, and kind of angle down the line as it starts to pitch so you can stay in front of it. I am really paying attention to what the shoulder is doing in front of me. Is it jacking up and getting ready to pitch, or is it kind of uh, fluffing down and getting ready to build on the inside. I'm always looking for what it's doing and if it's if it's ready to pitch in front of me I'll try to run down the line. If it's backing off I'll go back into the pocket and, and try to build more speed by coming back up up on the foam. So you want to stay in the pocket of the wave. That's the power point of the wave. It's typically the steepest and fastest point. And it'll help you initiate the moves quicker. If you find yourself out here you want to carve back and come back into the pocket fastest point of the wave. I don't keep blinders on. I don't always look in front. I always look behind me to see what the white water is doing. See if it's building, getting ready to, to pitch again, or if it's backing off and kind of getting ready to reform on the inside. Yeah, when I'm surfing on the waves, I like to carve my boat on either edge, get good acceleration up to the crest of the wave or back into the pocket of the wave. And then when I want to do tricks, I'll sit flat on the hull and allow the boat to plane and spin. The reason I use a 360 is for a purpose. It's to slow down. With the boats that I have, that we have these days, you can easily outrun a wave. They're very, very fast. So the key is to slow down. And I use a 360 to slow, to stall, to throw off speed of the boat, to set myself up for a steeper part of the wave. The other type of 360 I will do is I will do a, uh, f an outside 360 to come bring myself back into the pile, into the soup. The back surf is another fun maneuver. You have to spin around, then be sure to look down the line for other traffic. For a back surf, you'll steer at the front of the boat. Okay, the next basic move is the cutback. After you made your bottom turn, you want to switch edges of the boat. So you want to go flat for a second and then bring the other edge up and extend out on that side and turn back towards the power part of the wave. You don't want to get too far out on the shoulder. So the cutback will help you get back to the power part of the wave and stay close to the pocket. The cutback is a carving turn. The more slashing turn is called a lip turn or a top turn. For this, you drive up to the top and the tail of the boat frees up so you can come back into position and take the drop again. To go on kind of an advanced form of the cutback is what I call roundhouse cutback. So after you've made that bottom turn, made that cutback, 
Now you're coming back towards the wave. You want to flatten it out as you're going up the wave. And before you hit the foam, you want to switch edges. Stay above the foam, kind of right over the top, to come back down. You get all the speed off the top of the foam. It actually kind of launches you and throws you forward again. This section, roundhouse cut back. Petering out on me. Towards the rocks. <clears throat> So when you see a wave breaking down in front of you, come down the wave, make a good hard bottom turn, charge back up at the pile, bring it flat, switch edges, come over the foam, it'll kind of kick you down, and bring you back out into the green. It doesn't always happen, when it does, it's, it's special, it's really a, it's a great feeling. Rodeo boats designed for white water allow a flat spin on the wave face and tumbling in the soup. Classic board and kayak surfing has traditionally been done in the glassy part of the waves, with the occasional rodeo move at the end of the ride. Now, dynamic tumbling rodeo moves in the whitewater add exciting possibilities, but add a serious threat and obstacle to other surfers looking for a way out through the break. In an uncrowded area, it's a dynamic technique. That's been that's, that's a new move this year, is probably the blunt. And every now and then you get a nice spray off of it, and that's that's really cool when you get a spray. The next thing we're gonna learn is how to deal with something when it looks really bad coming at you. Yes, of course the big ones scare me. <laughs> the, the wave every now and then it just comes in and cleans you out. I mean, it's just like, the, I, I don't like those waves. Occasionally, larger wave can come in. And when the surf's big, I'm always keeping a very close eye out for that big wave. And I'm looking for an escape route. Once I've chosen to ride a big wave, I'm not afraid. Because the hardest part is making the decision to drop into the wave. Once you're on the big wave, I know what I can do. I know what the boat can do. I know what the wave's going to do. And I am just too busy thinking about beating speed down the line to avoid that big steep section or figuring out what I'm going to do next as the wave is changing. And it's too exciting to be afraid. A lot of it just comes from the experience of being out there. Don't put yourself into places that you're not skilled enough to be in. Have good experiences and then trust those skills that you develop as you move up into harder and bigger waves. And I had to deal with my fear. I mean, for a better part of a year, every time I'd go under, I'd have to deal with rolling, you know? And at, at night, I'd wake up in the beginning and I'd sort of get a little sweaty and I'd think, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but I just kept working on it. I just love it. I can't imagine not doing it until I'm 80. <laughs> so I would go out on a uh, friendly day when the waves were not very big and the waves were slowly breaking and get a feel for the ocean and just learn to en enjoy the entire atmosphere of the salt water, the air, the sound, the seagulls, the sea lions. Uh, we have an uh, obligation to understand our ocean because uh, it's important that we maintain the ocean's health. Well, that's a quick little look at the basics of kayak surfing. We hope you give it a try. You get greedy for the big ones real fast. Yeah.